Today on Ham Radio Q&A, I dig into the mailbag and answer your questions, so please keep watching for more. Hi, I'm Michael, KB9VBR, your host for Ham Radio Q&A. I'm on a mission to inspire and educate the amateur radio community, so if this is your first time watching, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Well, first off, I want to thank everyone for watching and subscribing. In the last month, this channel has passed a milestone of 1 million video views. We're also pushing towards 15,000 subscribers, so if you enjoy watching these videos, you're certainly in some good company. Well, next up, before I dig into the questions, I want to chat a bit about my previous video, which is on the ARRL's recent petition for rulemaking to expand HF privileges for the technician license holders. I've been a ham for 20 years now and have survived both the re license restructuring of 2000 and the dropping of the Morse code testing requirements of 2006, and both did not kill me. It's no surprise to me that this proposal, though, would bring out vocal and highly polarized opinion. I did a rough count of, of the over 200 comments left on this video in the first four days and found, um, despite you know, a few of those troll comments, most were generally in favor of this proposal with about an 85% approval rating. I think that's pretty good. Well, there are so many comments that I'm only going to pick out two. And I recommend that you know if you're really interested in this, you might want to peruse the rest of them because I was really pleased at how thoughtful and cogent, you know, almost all of those comments were. But I think Freddie hits the nail on the head on why this proposal is important. He writes, I feel it is very positive change with the new privileges of the tech. It will become more active and stay and or progress in class. Plus the growth in the service is a necessity. We, um, we, well that's him, just experienced a true emergency situation where the amateur service proved to be the only means of communications that our impacted area had for the communications period. And that included government assistant agencies for several days. So in short, more licensed operators at any level would have been a great asset. Sincerely, K0LC. Well, thanks for that comment, Freddie. Uh, one of the purposes of the amateur service is to provide emergency communications in a time of need. Our statewide, and that's uh, my state's, Aries Racy's group, has a very nice linked repeater system, yet it's dependent on voice over IP technology to stay online. We're finding that in a true disaster situation that HF is a better solution for regional communications. Having a technician class license holder with the ability to communicate, uh, communicate on 40 and 80 meters Envis would truly be an asset. Now there are those that will say that in a true stuff hits the fan emergency that licensing won't be an issue as anyone could transmit on any frequency. I'm going to argue that's the wrong statement and not accurate in the letter and spirit of this emergency provision. Plus, that mentality does nothing to train or prepare a person to operate in that manner. Moving on, I received a couple different questions on the same subject. Gerald asks, well, the other item ne that needs addressing is the renewal policy for expired licenses. The FCC, should, the FCC should allow anyone who has passed any of the exams to re-enter the service at any time. We should be doing everything to keep our numbers. There's a lot of upcoming technologies out there. Allow expired technicians to pay their money to rejoin, regardless of when their, their expiration date was. Well, actually, that provision already exists. Since 2014, an amateur can reclaim their expired license by passing the current technician exam. So if you were previously a general or an extra and let your license lapse, passing a technician exam and supplying proof of the previous license held will grant you your old license class. I think that's a pretty good compromise to the expired license situation. On my recent introduction to DMR presentation, I received this question from Christopher. Being a truck driver and not always in a good spot for a repeater, do you absolutely need a repeater or can it be uh, done through a hotspot device? Some hams, especially in areas that may not be served by a DMR repeater, are using their hotspots with a MiFi link. As long as you, have, you can receive cell service, uh, you have access to the network talk groups. But there's going to be one caveat, as your phone's data plan will need to support that use. An active channel could use uh, three to six megabytes of data an hour. 
and I believe your, uh, your average data will still be under about one gigabyte per month with average use. So, you know, this might be an excellent option for the over-the-road driver. On the Chameleon P-Loop review, Carl of Chameleon Antennas gives us a couple of tips. First off, on tuning the, the antenna with an analyzer, he says, do not hold the antenna analyzer when tuning. Put it on the ground well, uh, because your hand touching it will influence the SWR. Also, the Chameleon P-Loop, while having a very low takeoff angle in its default configuration, Carl mentions that it can also be used for near-vertical incidence skywave propagation. In order to use the P-Loop 2.0 for NVIS, you're going to need to rotate the antenna on the side while having the telescopic mast installed horizontally in order to increase the radiations upwards for 40 meters. Thanks, Carl, for providing these tips. And speaking of portable antennas, uh, Christiana says, you should do a video on HF, uh, affordable HF verticals antennas. Well, for that, I'd recommend the uh, Wolf River Silver Bullet coils. Now, you can put to together a coil and a whip for under $100. I have, I have one myself, and actually, I did a video review on that antenna last year, so you might want to check that out. Next up, uh, a few questions about the power pole splitter project I recently did. A uh, one crazy Nordlander reminds us that the National Electric Code, or NEC, does not recognize soldering as an allowed connection. It can come apart in high current situations. Crimping is much better. Thanks for this video. This kit and tool will be part of my arsenal soon. Well, that is correct. A proper crimp connection is better than a soldered one. And that's one of the reasons why I don't solder electrical connectors anymore. And next up, Reggie has got uh, the, the mnemonic uh, for remembering how to orient your power poles. Red, right, tongue, top. That's what I have memorized. And Mark admired the battery that was in the background of, my, of the video. Uh, he, he says, you left out one detail, which is admittedly off the subject. And that is the battery in the background. I was also interested in what you did to connect to the battery terminals. Well, thanks for noticing the battery. It's a U1 sized 12 volt lead acid AGM battery that I purchased at Fleet Farm, which is a farm supply store here in the upper Midwest. I used a couple of ring terminals that I crimped to a short piece of zip wire. Of course, a power pole connector is on the end uh, for easy connection to my splitter. And finally, Scott wrote in with a question about making a purchase decision between two radios. Great video. I'm kind of going between the ICOM IC718 or the ICOM 7300. I'm not really, sh uh, it's not such a, a money decision. It's more of what do I want to simplicity or the high-tech bells and whistles? Any opinions? This is a great question. You know, I think it's really hard to compare the IC718 and the IC7300 as they are two different, uh, two different technologies from two different generations. Uh, there's a lot of features of the IC7300 that would be either considered top of the line or unavailable uh, when the IC718 was introduced. But with that said, the IC718 is very simple to operate. I can sit a ham down in front of it who has never operated HF before and get them on the air in five minutes or less. Plus, I know they won't get lost in the menus or settings and totally screw the whole thing up. Transmit audio is superb, receive is sensitive, and it's gonna run full duty cycle all day long. What the IC7300 brings is a sophistication in filtering and digital signal processing plus the full support for digital modes with its built-in sound card interface. To work digital, I had to add a signal link to the IC718, which is another $100 expense. Plus the 718 doesn't have a built-in tuner. But you know, that really, that's not a big deal, as you, you're gonna want an extend, external tuner uh, with either radio anyways. I think the downfall of the IC718 is that the DSP is on the AF stage so that when the bands are noisy, it's going to get very weary uh, to listen for long stretches. Nor does the IC718 have 6 meter support. So the final word, if you want simple bulletproof rig, go with the IC718. If you want sophistication of a modern SDR based transceiver, then the IC7300 is for you. Well, do you have any questions or comments? Please leave them below. I'll pick out the best of ones uh, for my next Your Questions Answered video. 
And always, for more articles and information, please check out my blog at www.jpol-antenna.com. Your support of this channel drives the production of future videos, so if you like this video, give me that big thumbs up, and also check out some of the other videos that are suggested right alongside here. And don't forget to hit subscribe. Pressing subscribe is your way to be notified when future videos are released. Well, that's it for this time. I'm Michael, KB9VBR. Have a great day and 73.